The hormone oxytocin has captured both scientific and lay interest for its role in social behavior. Over the past decade, there have been countless studies in which the behavioral effects of intranasal oxytocin have been studied and have demonstrated that intranasal oxytocin can improve your ability to understand what others are thinking and feeling, increase gaze to the eye region, which is important for communication, and improve social responsiveness in kids with autism, among many other findings. But despite these impressive results, scientists don't have a good understanding of what's happening in the brain after oxytocin administration. There are several fMRI studies which have looked at the effects of intranasal oxytocin on neural activity. In general, participants are given an intranasal oxytocin spray and then presented with social stimuli such as emotional faces during fMRI. But this growing area of research has reported mixed results. In an effort to synthesize these studies, Sally Grace and her team performed a systematic review and meta-analysis which was recently published in the journal Psychoneuroendocrinology. Here's Sally on the story behind this paper. The main reason I decided to do a systematic review and meta-analysis of the effects of intranasal oxytocin in the brain was to inform myself and new researchers and current researchers to the field of oxytocin what has been done, but also to identify any potential gaps in methodology in the literature and to see if there was a brain region or a set of brain regions that are reliably activated by intranasal oxytocin in the brain in humans. In this study, Sally and her team extracted data from 39 intranasal oxytocin fMRI studies and then synthesized this data using activation likelihood estimation. Here's Sally again on the results of her study. I didn't end up finding what previous meta-analyses have found because I didn't find that a consistent brain region was activated or deactivated by oxytocin. This wasn't that surprising to me because we're looking and collapsing data from a number of different methodologies from tasks of basic emotional processes to dynamic social interactions. But I think that the main take home message was that we really need to answer a lot of the groundwork questions like what is the correct dosage? How is it getting to the brain? Uh, what is the effect in males and females? Because at the end of the day, we really want this to be a treatment for psychiatric illnesses. And before we can do that, we really need to answer these basic questions. There are two particularly noteworthy aspects of the study, in my opinion. First, Usually the amygdala is implicated in response to intranasal oxytocin, including my own work, but Sally and her team didn't find this, suggesting that maybe the amygdala isn't as central to oxytocin's effects as we first thought. Secondly, the brain activation coordinates used in this meta-analysis, as well as the data set and scripts to perform the effect size meta-analysis, are openly available on Open Science Framework. Meta-analyses can often be a black box in that we're usually not sure what data was entered into the analysis. So a big thumbs up to Sally and her team for providing the data so that others can recreate the analysis. Find Sally online on Twitter at Sally A. Grace, that's one word, and check out the show notes for a link to the article. Until next time, bye-bye.